I'm Devin Terrell, uh, the media program officer for the Stanley Foundation. Um, as my colleague Jai uh, mentioned in the opening remarks, um, our organization works across several issue areas um, that all relate to global uh, peace and security concerns, including climate change, nuclear policy, and mass violence and atrocities. Um, I worked as a documentary film producer myself for many years before uh, joining the foundation. Um, and now in my role at the foundation, I collaborate with media organizations, journalists, and other story storytellers to strengthen their understanding of the issues that we focus on with the goal to foster quality reporting um, and to increase the kinds of stories that can build a more peaceful and secure world. Uh, what's really interesting about my work at the foundation and working with media in particular is how clear it is from my vantage point uh, that so many challenges to um, and opportunities for building a lasting peace connect to the free flow of information. So I'm very happy to be introducing this panel and the three guests who are going to discuss a number of the ideas around this critical pillar of peaceful societies. Um, moderating this discussion is Mark Leon Goldberg here on the left. Um, he's editor of the global affairs blog, UN Dispatch, and some of you may be familiar with him as the host of the Global Dispatches podcast. Uh, Mark's work has been featured in the New York Times, The Guardian, The Washington Post, Foreign Policy, Newsweek, and the LA Times, among others. And he appears regularly as an on-air guest for Al Jazeera English, National Public Radio, and the BBC. Um, joining him are two panelists, um, journalist and social media researcher, Anna Therese Day and editor-at-large and Africa editor of IRIN News, Obi Anya DK. Um, Anna's work as a journalist and commentator has been featured in a variety of media outlets, including CNN, Al Jazeera English, and CBS, and her coverage has focused on American foreign policy, women's issues, and youth. Um, Obi has over two decades of experience covering the African continent as a journalist and editor, with a particular focus on security and development issues. He's currently working on two year-long reporting assignments on climate change and violent extremism. And Obi's also a board member of the Grafamako Women in Media Network, promoting women journalists in Africa. Um, so the free flow of information is defined as free and independent media that disseminates inf information in a way that leads to better informed citizens, greater openness and inclusiveness, better decision making, and more rational responses in times of crisis. So uh, we are going to look at this issue from a number of different angles, and we're also going to give an opportunity for everyone to ask questions as well. With that, I'll hand it over to Mark. Thank you, Dana. Thank you. Thank you all uh, for being here, for uh, being the first panel after lunch. I, I have like an extra uh, important duty to keep everyone awake, but I, I assure you we will. Um, so we're having this conversation, I think, at a fairly auspicious time, a conversation about the free flow of media. I mean, as, as uh, David pointed out this morning uh, when he did his presentation on the, the new Positive Peace Index, uh, the free flow of media and the freedom of the press correlates strongly uh, to outbreak of, of conflict. It's, as, as David pointed out in his um, in, in his slide, that when the uh, World Freedom of the Press Index declines, that predicts an outbreak of, of violent conflict. And of all the pillars, uh, the free flow of information pillar is one that has not experienced uh, an increase and is, in fact, on a slight decline. So that, that's, that's one trend that we're going to uh, discuss. Um, on top of this all, we're experiencing some unprecedented attacks on the media, not just from the traditional sources, but from you know, the President of the United States, the, the President of the country that gave us the, the, the First Amendment. Uh, and then to complicate matters even further, the whole media industry is reinventing itself. I mean, it's sort of a cliche at this point to talk about the ways in which legacy media is dying off, but it's, it's true. Uh, and it's something that the three of us, uh, you know, are, are struggling with in our day-to-day -day work. Um, but amid all this chaos and amid all this tumult and all this transformation, there are some really interesting and innovative things happening in the field of journalism. And two exemplars and practitioners of that are joining us on stage. Um, you know, there is both, both Obi and Anna, as they will describe, have reported from conflict, but I would not call them conflict journalists. 
uh, I would call them solutions journalists in conflict. And this is, this is something I think that Jamil pointed out in his, uh, in his introduction uh, yesterday, how, or in his, uh, during, during lunch. How do we um, elevate, I think I'm gonna try to quote him directly, how do we elevate the media to cover peace more frequently and violence more thoughtfully? And these two people joining me on stage are two members of the media who do that on a daily basis. Um, so I want to kick off this conversation by having Anna, uh, who I've known, I've, I've worked with in, in the past, uh, talk about solutions journalism. She has covered uh, conflict in, in Syria and elsewhere from behind enemy lines, yet she has done so in a thoughtful way and also in a way that focuses on solutions. So what is solutions journalism, Anna? How would you define it? How do you describe it? How do you practice it? Thanks, Mark. Um, for our purposes today, I kind of wanted to go over three principles of solutions journalism. Uh, the first is distinguishing it from feel-good stories, um, soft, fluffy stories. Those are disparaging terms that have often historically been applied to journalists trying to cover security in a more comprehensive way, whether talking about soft power or diplomacy or the role of civil society. That's something that's not often encouraged in a media climate where what bleeds leads. Um, so solutions journalism really tackles that, saying it's actually irresponsible and not fully doing your job and due diligence as a journalist if you're not including a more comprehensive understanding of, of conflict. Uh, the second kind of principle I wanted to share is the idea of journalists being, uh, or demanding that your journalists be uh, skeptical, not cynical. It's very easy to report on everything wrong in a situation. It's really much more difficult and challenging to get a historical perspective, to understand the complexities of a political process, to show what's working, what's not, and to inform your audience, ultimately, of what options they have to pressure their elected officials to make certain policy decisions. Um, and the third that I wanted to kind of raise today is the why, why this is important, particularly in this climate of um, press freedom, or threats to press freedom, and then also a decline in confidence in the media. Um, it's really reevaluating the role of journalists in the fourth estate. We've traditionally thought of that, um, our role as a check to power, but it does include more. It's serving the public in terms of providing uh, citizens uh, information in a free and fair democracy. It's helping citizens who are not experts on any global issue um, arming them with the information that they need to understand what's being done by their governments in their names and what policy options they could be pushing for an alternative to the chaos that they see on the breaking news. Um, so those are the kind of three principles I, I wanted to share in why this is not a departure and in any way from tr traditional muckraking, vigorous fact-checking, sourcing triangulation, all of the best ethical practices of journalism. It's kind of a self-audit of demanding more um, and understanding that we serve the public and that's um, our ultimate contribution to the fourth estate. Obi, I, I mean, how, how does that sort of sound to you? Does that sort of resonate with the kind of work that you have done, that you see yourself doing? Yes, it does. I, I didn't realize that solutions journalism was actually a thing. Um, but it's, it's kind of what Erin does. We, we, we're, we're a humanitarian news and analysis service which tries to make the, the impacts more accountable, more effective. Um, it's a $25 billion industry that no one uh, actually has much scrutiny over, who try and do marvelous work, but sometimes uh, there are problems in terms of how uh, the aid response uh, is implemented. So that's basically that's the, the kind of parameters within which our kind of coverage sits. Um, and, and just to, to to echo uh, what Anna said, that I think it's, it's kind of, if, if you're not, it's not complete reporting, if you, if you don't actually look at the solutions as well, if you don't look at, at the impact, it's not really honest journalism if we just report on the crisis and we're not reporting on, on how, um, on, on, on impact and, and how, how, how your response can, 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 can affect people. And that's the other issue, I think, is in, in a sense, in terms of agency. I think it's, it's kind of incumbent on us to try and remember the issue of agency that you're reporting on people <clears throat> and how they tackle their issues is important and vital to understand and I think that's, that's, that voice 
uh, often gets missed out. Um, so for me, the solutions, solutions journalism is, is, is critical in terms of learning lessons. Um, we, we're trying it in terms of our climate change coverage. Um, we're looking at adaptation. We're trying to look at it in terms of lessons, not just learned, but lessons being learned. It's an ongoing process. Um, sometimes solutions journal journalism is criticized as advocacy journalism. Um, I, I, then I'm, I'm quite honest in to say that I, I'm, I'm an advocate. I, I try and advocate uh, the rights of people who are, who are missed out and marginalized. I have no bones about that at all. Um, I think it's important to take a side in, in a sense. And for me, that is very clear that the kind of reporting I want to do is about disempowerment and how that impacts on people and to try and hold uh, the powerful accountable. Um, Anna, can you maybe like break it down a, a little bit for us by giving us an example of maybe a story you've done or a story that you know of that some of your, your colleagues and friends have done that's a good example of like the solutions journalism in action in like a particularly tough environment? Like what, what does it actually mean? Sure. Um, I report primarily in the Middle East, a region that we most often associate with extremism, even though there's decades worth of data that show that there's a moderate majority in the Middle East that has the same values that we have in the United States um, and elsewhere in the world. We had, you know, in 2011, uh, millions of young people putting their lives on the line, demanding a more participatory, participatory role in their the futures of their societies. So we see this on the ground as reporters seeing everyone fighting, whether it be NGOs, whether it be public servants trying to work in good faith against corruption. We see this all the time, and that's not really reflected in the media, um, which I'm, of course, a part. Um, so I report uh, in, I guess, the two kind of things I would say with that is um, accountability would be maybe the most important thing with solutions journalism and the work that I do. Um, and again, not a departure from traditional journalism, but in the context of <coughs> Syria, for example, we've had excellent reporting, but it's been totally under-resourced um, from the beginning of the conflict. And we haven't had, there wasn't a lot of uh, reporting on different governments' roles um, in the conflict, even in the humanitarian response. Um, one positive thing that we had as a result of the journalism industry being in decline is we had a lot of veteran reporters, freelance reporting with us in the field. They were able to give us that kind of comparative knowledge of what the State Department was doing in uh, the Balkans, what mechanisms uh, were not being employed in the context of Syria. Um, so that was really eye-opening to know it, what your government is and is not doing, what they could be doing, what they're not employing. Um, also in the context of Syria, I would say that uh, one thing that has been you know, incredibly uh, unbelievable and I think unforgivable has been the uh, humanitarian response. And although we have a full-on response to Syria, unlike many other conflicts on Earth, um, a lot of governments haven't uh, engaged as constructively as they have. And even the reporting has rendered citizens of the world who are in solidarity with refugees, not understanding their options. We have Canada just to the north of the United States that privately funds refugees. There are churches in the United States that are raising money to then support refugees in a country that has a more progressive uh, uh, refugee policy. On the ground in Lebanon, um, right now, I'm reporting in a, con or in a country that a quarter of their population is now Syrian refugees. Obviously, Lebanon is a country with significantly limited capacity to absorb that kind of um, guest population, yet we're reporting on um, young entrepreneurs who are uh, helping the United Nations in their humanitarian response, what they're doing um, as someone, as people with quite a closer proximity to the conflict. So if young people in Lebanon can take this enormous pro uh, problem and see how they can plug in in a constructive way. Those are the kinds of stories we want to share globally so people in good faith can act with or without their governments. So uh, I guess, Anna, are you suggesting that if the reporting from earlier on in the Syrian conflict had the kind of similar like support that it had during the Balkans, that you would have seen a more compassionate response on the part of, say, the United States and, and the American public? I think so. One example I'd give, because Mercy Corps is here, and they've actually been working in some of these communities right over the 
uh, Turkish border in northern Syria. These are opposition-held areas that have been strangled for uh, years now. And uh, we had IDP internally displaced um, camps right along the border of tens of thousands of people. And you could literally uh, see, it was on slightly higher ground, and you could see into Turkey the proper uh, hospitals that are, are great inside Turkey. And to have children freezing to death or dying by falling into a ditch a mile from uh, a proper hospital um, shows that it wasn't an issue of access, it was an issue of political will um, to understand that there were things that we could be doing on Syria that could have helped um, counter violent extremism, for example, earlier on in the conflict. And those kinds of, that kind of urgency to the humanitarian response was never fully supported. Uh, Obi, can you uh, sort of discuss or, or describe a story that you've reported that would fall in, you know, under the remit of, of solutions journalism. Um, I know you've done a lot of reporting from the Sahel, from West Africa. What, from, from your experience, um, what sort of stories have you told that talk not only about the conflict going on, but, that in, but also of the idea of agency that you identified, uh, of the sort of indigenous solutions to these conflicts? That's a hard one. Um, but I think, yeah, uh, looking at the issue around violent extremism, I, I think we, we tend to see it in, in very simplistic terms, and it's a very complex issue. Um, you know, historically, people who are historically people who are who are jihadists or follow, following violent extremist ideas are, are either crazy um, or misguided at, at best. And I think one of the interesting times I spent was, was with um, some Boko Haram prisoners in, in, in jail and to try and understand their motivations, what, what drove them. And I think it, it, was, it becomes increasingly clear that there's issues around governance. The pillars that we see do, do trend quite, quite clearly. And there's issues around governance, around marginalization. Um, there's, and then we, we have personal problems. It's, it's, it's called psychology, I, I know, and I stand corrected by uh, a doctor friend from Harvard. But um, it, in a sense, the, the degree of anger that, that drives people. Um, so those, that, that for me was a kind of an insight. Um, often we, we try, we find it difficult to comprehend why people do what they do um, until you try and understand the background that, they, that they've been through. And that was, was an eye-opening moment. Um, and it was very, and again, it was, it, was, it was impossible to cat categorize um, these guys I, I was talking to. I mean, some were solid ideologues, some were opportunists, some were learned, uh, others weren't. And I think that range of complexity um, is something that needs to be understood when we try and implement prevention of PVE, preventing violent extremism, um, that these aren't simple solutions. Um, and talking to uh, a Nigerian psych psychologist, I mean, her take was, we need to have a system-wide reforms. It's not just we tackle jobs. It's not just we tackle opportunity. We need to look at the education system. We need to look at what shapes and forms people. Um, and what we've seen in, throughout the 1980s um, and into the 90s the collapse of, the, of state spending, the collapse of social services, um, the destruction of welfare, the welfare safety nets, um, even in a sense as kind of the decline of ideology. In, in the 70s, we would see resistance would be very much in, in political terms. Resistance now becomes much more in terms of uh, religion. Um, and I think basically it's a, it's a call for justice um, which sometimes is, is uh, overlooked. And for me, that was kind of eye-opening. So I'll stick uh, with you, Obi, but, but also uh, open this question to Anna. So the, the report identifies that the pillar of the free flow of information correlates most strongly with uh, acceptance of the rights of others and the well-functioning of, of the government. So as you know, pillar A does well, pillar B and C do well as well, and, and converse, the, the converse is true. Um, how, Obi, have you seen that dynamic in action um, in countries that rank poorly on the uh, peace index? 
Sorry. So, so how have you seen the correlation between the free flow of information, say restrictions against the free flow of information and increased hostility towards the rights of others or a decrease in the functioning of, of a government? Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's clear that when, you, when you're dealing with a, with a government that has something to hide, uh, the first target is often the media and the NGO world as well. Um, I, th I think we see that time and again. And I think what's, what's interesting is that we're, there's ways around it. I mean, there's, there's a challenge and, and there's also a kind of a solution. And we're seeing the fragmentation of the media has positives and negatives. Um, the rise of social media means that there are ways around uh, these types of restrictions that we're seeing not just in, in, in on the continent, but perhaps even closer to home as well. Um, so, in a, in a sense, it's it's how how you respond. The, the free flow of information. Just just uh, I'm kind of interested in that because we also have to be careful in in, in what we're describing uh, the free flow of information as meaning. I think you know there's issues around the content, the type of information that is flowing and where it's coming from as well. Um, I think what we're seeing increasingly is governments realizing that information now is, is, is critical and moving into that space. Uh, we're seeing it in the shutting down of internet services, not just in Africa, but we, we're seeing that around the world, unfortunately. We're seeing the governments controlling access, um, which is another way of, of starving journalists um, of sources and, and of, of information. So it, it, in a sense, it is a, is an, it's an onslaught in, in many countries that the, the journalists are under, um, but there are ways around it. So, so Anna, you have worked in a lot of the places that have some of the most restrictive and dangerous, um, uh, restrictive policies against journalism, uh, but also are just frankly dangerous for journalists, yet you have gotten around that. What strategies have you employed uh, in the service of telling solutions, of doing solutions journalism, in, in tough places? Um, I would say that unfortunately, broadly, uh, there have been a lot of evolution in tactics over the past few years, but because of the increasing threat, um, I'm in the press freedom space and we say we face three threats. The first from uh, UN member states, and that whether that be Egypt and Turkey, some of the largest jailers of journalists on earth, or the United States uh, surveilling and detaining journalists um, at their borders. Um, we face the threat of criminal organizations, whether designated uh, terrorist organizations or mafia in Latin America. And uh, these organizations now having social media. In the past, journalists traditionally were able to work with these groups uh, because they wanted somebody to be the messenger. Now we're more valuable as hostages than we are as messengers to these um, different groups. Um, the last is the threat from within, which is the decreasing uh, uh, revenue sources for media organizations and their inability to properly support journalists working in hostile environments around the world. I would say as a result of that, none of those structural issues have been, have been met. Um, in fact, uh, most of the places that I work, um, many of my colleagues that I worked with five years ago, whether sources or journalists in these countries are in jail or have been killed. Um, so it's an incredibly unbelievable environment. But one lesson I'd say we'd learned from Syria is um, developing ways to triangulate information uh, from sources on the ground that are inaccessible. And that's been a whole digital process that's taken years to develop. But after we've kind of developed these secure lines of communication, um, and this has been very collaborative journalists of multiple media organizations um, on the same threads, getting the same kind of insights. Um, we have applied that to uh, situations like Yemen, um, and also they're trying to apply some of these principles to South Sudan. So we're hoping that these kind of micro organizing uh, tactics um, can be applied elsewhere in the world where journalists face enormous threats. So, so Obi, I, I flipped on CNN this morning when I woke up and I saw this report from Arwa Damon, who's a great international reporter from Niger. Uh, you're reporting from the scene of the uh, attack that killed uh, four American servicemen and I believe two Nigerian uh, uh, military members as well. And I, I thought to myself, um, this is how the American public and, and sort of all of CNN international watching audiences will understand Niger 
from, from here on in. And she's a, a great reporter. I, I, you know, she's been on my podcast. I think she does brave and amazing work. But um, you know, again, she is a conflict reporter. How um, you have also reported from Niger. You've reported um, on, on instances and ways in which um, you know, societies are pushing back against violent extremism in that country. Uh, I'm wondering how you judge or how you interpret the kind of feedback loop that comes from the fact that what we uh, in America now know of Niger, now see of Niger, what most Americans see of Niger, will be exclusively interpreted through that lens of conflict and through that lens of, of violence. I feel it's a bit unfair <laughs> on, on CNN, to be honest. I mean, it, we, we expect maybe a little bit too much from, from what is a business. Um, so in a sense for CNN, Niger is forever now about uh, the special forces guys who were killed. Similarly, Somalia is about Black Hawk Down. Um, these are you know, episodic events. I mean, the, the, the international media ha, ha, has to work on, on hooks. I mean, it's, it's, I seem to remember during the, the, I don't know if you do, but during the, the, the flooding in Mozambique, there was a, Mozambique became a cause celeb because there was a woman up a tree who gave birth. But at the same time that Mozambique was happening, there was a terrible flood in India as well. But the, because of that particular hook, the news media focus on Mozambique and, and not on India. Access to, to the Indian flood zone was also harder as well. So in a sense, I, yes, I mean, there, there is a, the, the danger of parachute journalism. We, we're well aware of it. Uh, it's, 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 it's beguiling and it's, it's oversimplifying um, and people react usually late to the crisis. I mean, before this terrible event happened in Nigeria involving the American soldiers, They'd been in an attack uh, two weeks before on gendarmes and 13 died. And before that, there has been growing crises flowing out of Mali, which the international media weren't covering. I, I, I think it's hard to, to blame them for not doing it. Um, but in terms of what I do uh, and, other, and other solutions journalists, is that you know, we, we try and, and report as accurately and fairly as we can on a, on a more consistent basis. Um, the idea is it's not news. Sorry, it's not news because the American soldiers died, but the greater story is that we have uh, a bubbling, uh, metastasizing issue in in the centre of the Sahel, uh, and the response we keep on seeing is a militarised response, which seems to be fueling that particular problem. Unfortunately, the Americans have been in Niger for quite a while. They're building a massive base in Agadez. Uh, and I don't think the military solution uh, that is being um, forwarded by America and also um, Western nations really is a solution to that crisis. And unfortunately, it, it is, in a sense, is inflaming the problem uh, and creating uh, more jihadist sympathizers. Um, I, do you want to, is there anything you want to add? Uh, so I'm getting like eyes from the audience, and, and I've sat through the previous uh, panel, so I know how interesting and engaged this audience is. Uh, I can, I'll take some questions. I have more questions I, I can ask myself, and I'm happy to open it up a bit. Um, yes. Yeah, we'll just kind of make our way around. Yeah, please. Thank you, Chad. Uh, where is the best place to get access to solution journalism? Because clearly, for most of us and our friends, we get the, the national news. That's what comes through. Um, I know when I did my Rotary Peace Fellowship and we talked about peace journalism, which with a couple of people here today, we've talked about whatever happened to peace journalism. Um, I will say that out of all the news sources we looked at, Al Jazeera was the only one that we could really call um, peace journalism. And, um, but so it's like, where did that go? How can we get it back? And it sounds like solution journalism is kind of the new peace journalism, but what is the most effective way for us to get access to that, even under-resourced? Uh, I would say um, this, this speaks to a point that Obi said before about um, consistent coverage. And unfortunately, I can't necessarily point to a news outlet, but I would say that there are some news outlets that have not um, <coughs> totally destroyed their international bureau system. And I think that's so important because it's really hard for parachuting journalists to, de de to, de de uh, to develop a beat 
and that's so necessary in to understand context and history and everything that goes into it to even be able to do solutions journalism. I would say a lot of the wires still have bureaus around the world. That's not <coughs> consistent, however. Um, so uh, that's that's what I would look for, somebody who has, an, and that does put the burden on the consumer. Um, I think media literacy is a big uh, thing that we need to push right now, but I would say that's the biggest challenge, that we don't have an infrastructure for um, expertise in the way we may have in the past. I'll just echo, echo what Anna said. I, I think, the, well, obviously you should subscribe to Erin, it's free. Um, <laughs> but I think that there's an interesting change, and, and, and also media literacy is, is vitally important. Sorry, I, I think there's, there's an interesting change that's before, back in the day, the argument was always who creates the news um, where is it manufactured? And the argument was always that it's the Western bias, etc. But I think what's interesting now is that if you want to know what's happening about Kenya, you, you, you access your Twitter feed and you, you look and you see it's there. Uh, it's, it's, it, I think the, the, the world has, I mean, that's the, the challenge, but also the wonderful thing about this media fragmentation, that there is media out there now. You, it's, you have to be, it's harder to navigate for sure, but it's there and it's more direct and accessible. And I, I, I would have plugged Erin as, as well, and, and which is one of several like niche sites um, that, uh, you know, and, and there are other niche sources as well that cover certain industries, that cover certain ideas and topics um, that, that do this on a consistent basis. The challenge, I think, is that the main media outlets like CNN or the New York Times don't do this on a consistent basis. Sometimes they do it. Sometimes certain reporters will will tell a story, but there are though, because of this media fragmentation, still uh, a number of entities and organizations, mostly which are primarily philanthropically funded. Uh, it's not a commercial enterprise. There's not a lot of, I think, advertising money and other models to be made in, in, in solutions journalism, but these things do, do exist. You just have to know how to find them, and oftentimes they're just talking to people in their industry as well. Um, Hello, I'm Joyce Anastasia, and I'm a transformational leadership consultant at Lead by Wisdom. And I have had the um, privilege and honor to do some independent media work, in, um, particularly in uh, Egypt when Mubarak stepped down. And there are two things I want to ask both of you about, and that is... Um, when I was there, uh, there were very few other people who were there from outside of Egypt. And um, there was such fear mongering going on in the media here. That's the first thing. And when I arrived there and was on uh, Tahrir Square, there was literally no violence the entire time that I was there. Yet the media feed over here and in many parts of the world were these uh, very violent images. Uh, that's number one I'd like you to address. How do you address that as, um, as news reporters? And then the second one is um, when I came back to the United States, I felt very much like I could not report on this because people's lives were in danger. I had run into the woman who had, um, who had uh, contacted people for the media, uh, 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 social media, when the cell phones were shut down. And uh, I, I was literally afraid for her life. So I did not report on anything when I returned. And, uh, but I, didn't, I wasn't working for someone who I was beholden to. So Anna, um, if I'm not mistaken, you too were in Ferrier Square and, and reporting and the, uh, the, the Egypt revolution. Yes, um, so I'm spoiled because that was a story, you know, some journalists wait their whole lives for and that was one of my first stories ever. Um, and I had the same experience of being in complete um, solidarity and I was helped by protesters to get access and the only violence that we saw was from the government. Um, I would say, unfortunately, that wasn't, you know, everybody's experience. There was um, the instance of Laura Logan who was attacked, which is, you know, heartbreaking that anyone had such a different experience, and we've seen those issues um, in many different cases since in Egypt. Uh, 
But one thing that I think was interesting for a lot of journalists um, like me who were freelance and starting off is we had um, such an opportunity to cover it because at that point so many of the international bureaus had already <coughs> scaled back their um, staffing all over the Middle East. So um, they had to fly everybody in and we were already there and they were, you know, had the phone numbers of the same press people of the Mubarak government that they talked to for 30 years. Um, and we were on the street, fluent in the social media and the kind of nonviolent youth resistance that was leading the revolution. So it was a huge opportunity for, for young journalists. Um, and we saw, I mean, there was a moment where uh, CNN was reporting. Um, we've heard reports that the tear gas canisters say made in the USA and all of the journalists who were on the street came back and they said, you've heard reports like we're on the street and all of the tear gas canisters are everywhere and they say made in the USA. So we think like that was, um, I think, really telling of the lack of uh, infrastructure that the international media has to cover these things. Um, but I would say I've seen the same thing of security issues for our sources everywhere um, as early as 2012 in Syria. We had um, you know, you were used to just kind of protecting very sensitive sources, usually security sources who had defected, but we saw very early on that um, they were hacking any activist, and those activists, if they were still inside Syria, were being arrested, and many are missing to this day. So um, I think there's been a learning curve in terms of journalists understanding their responsibility to their sources, and that digital security is now part of your responsibility to your source and keeping them safe. Um, and yeah, unfortunately, there have been too many examples of uh, journalists endangering uh, their sources. I'll take, yeah, we'll take uh, another question from the side of the room, and I'll, I promise I'll sweep left. Thanks very much. I'm David Wood of Equal Access International. We're a non-profit uh, organization doing communications for social change work, including a lot of peace-building work in the Sahel. We're in Burkina Faso, Chad, Niger, Cameroon, northern Nigeria, Afghanistan, Pakistan. Now I've got in the plug for my organization. I wanted to get in a plug for some very positive, smart thinking people who still work at USAID and the State Department. Uh, we're running a $25 million project across the Sahel with USAID funding. So that may be peanuts compared to the amount they're putting into Agadez, which is for sure they'll be putting in a lot more than $25 million. But I just wanted to say that there are still people in the government who believe in the power of communications for, for peace building. Uh, the State Department funded a TV station which we set up and run in northern Nigeria. An entire TV station called Arewa 24, we run it out of Kano, all in Hausa. It's, uh, the part of funding comes from what they call CVE, Countering Violent Extremism, and what we always call peace building. So I just wanted to say that they are still out there, people trying in government to do their best. That funding perhaps came before January of this year. So. Who knows whether more large pools of funding will be available to civil society organizations to carry on communications work for peace building. But certainly, we've been a beneficiary of that, and we like to believe that the people in the countries where we work are also benefiting greatly from that. Can, can, can I just maybe ask you, you a question while, while sure. you have the mic? Uh, the new White House budget request that, that came out last year presumably cuts those funds sharply. Um, do you have any contingency plans for continuing those kinds of, 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 of projects if this funding eventually dries up? We do, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, of course, that's a concern for any nonprofit like ours where we, are, you know, we, we have a lot of funding from the State Department and USAID. Um, but we do have other funders as well. In fact, I was talking to somebody from Peace Direct and there's Canadian funding, etc. There are other sources of funding. Um, we find it very unlikely, it's not impossible, we find it very unlikely that a project which has started and which so much has been invested in would have the rug pulled away from under it. You never know. But at the moment, we, we have a lot of believers in that community, particularly people who live and work in the Sahel and at the embassy in Nigeria, for example, very strong believers in the power of communications. And long may that last. And hopefully they won't be swept away by people who would rather put the money into tanks and guns and soldiers. I'll get my flowers out and wave them around. Sorry about uh, that. Yeah, any, uh, yeah, 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 sure. Hi, um, Mark Nelson from the Peace Innovation Lab here at Stanford. Quick question about business models, because I think Oli really nailed the fact that we expect too much of CNN because they are a business, um, and then sort of stacked against that, the challenge of 
funding with philanthropic dollars or tax dollars, which are both coming out of much smaller buckets. Have you seen any alternative business models that aren't driven fundamentally by trying to capture people's attention, capture people's eyeballs, which our professor from Harvard would say is based on um, you have to give them bad news, you have to give them threat perception because that's what the human brain responds to in so, so much larger quantities than, than uh, good news. So um, if, if you have a non, uh, yeah, is, is there any kind of a business model out there that has a chance of scaling better than the, the philanthropy funded models because the challenge there is they just don't scale very well because that's such a small bucket to draw from. Um, that, that is sustainable and scalable and, and that aligns incentives um, with um, solutions uh, rather than with bad news because as we're seeing with the new fragmented mediascape that's still based on the old business model of capturing attention, capturing eyeballs and those business models have been used against us in the last year in ways that uh, I would argue are even worse than CNN. So. Uh, yeah, I wonder if this is, this is a, a fraught question so we'll have uh, <laughs> answers from both. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, some, I think sometimes uh, the peace process is, is kind of incompatible uh, with news. It's structurally incompatible with news. But I, I think that there is the, the philanthropic model. I think maybe we just have to accept that that's the only model that's going at the moment because uh, the, the commercial model isn't working. Uh, we've seen it. It's not just in legacy media in, in America or Europe, but on the, on the African continent as well. I mean, people have tried everything, going up market, down market. It's still, but people are reading more. Now, that's the irony of it. People are accessing more media, they're just not paying for it. Uh, so the news is getting out there. So if your idea is that you want uh, your solutions journalism to have legs, um, pay, in a sense, paying for it kind of works and it gets <coughs> amplified. Um, I'm, I'm just talking to uh, the point you made. I, I think that journalism can play, a work, play a, an important role in terms of peace building. The radio station you talked about, there's another one uh, called Dandalkura, which is, which is vo yes, in Kanuri, uh, is it, and, and also maybe even in Burundi. We saw maybe the, the impact of years of, of working with media has had. I mean, the, we have a terrible crisis in Burundi, which hasn't yet turned into the genocidal madness that we had two decades ago. Maybe it's because of the investment that's gone into peace building, training journalists. So maybe this is just something that we have to accept at, the, at this point in time. And I know this is a, 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 a night nice concept and I, uh, that consumes your, your day as well. Yes. So. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, I would second Obi, of course. Uh, we, need, we need funding for, um, a, for all of this kind of journalism. You'll see that a lot of the best investigations in the United States right now are being funded um, privately through philanthropic um, uh, entities. But I would say something that America seems allergic to is the, the idea of um, public broadcasting and uh, paying for your news and taxes. Um, this happens in Europe. Um, it's because they believe in an informed democracy. And I would love to see something like that in America because um, I do think a lot of journalists are working in systems that uh, prevent them from doing their best work or following the stories they'd love to be covering that they feel important as somebody with a beat. But um, that's, that's not the business model they're working in. I think it would allow journalists to be public servants, which I think money probably identify, for, or identify with. Um, again, not something that we have in the United States. We're allergic to taxes, but it is something that other Western countries have that have created the journalism that, like the BBC, which still has some of the best journalism and global coverage in the whole world. Mm -hmm. So I, I would just, just add that I too am convinced that philanthropy is probably the most important single um, part of this conversation. But if there is to be a model that is not the philanthropic model that might just sustain the kind of solutions journalism we're talking about, it could be the explanatory journalism model that's been pioneered by people like Vox Media. Uh, that has demonstrated some commercial viability and commercial success, but has not yet made that switch to talking uh, about, or it, to consistently talking about peace and issues and, and conflict issues, though they're, they're pretty close. And if they can do that, then I think there might be some hope yet for the, the commercial model, but that's, you know, TB, TBD. Um, uh, yes, back there, yeah. So the 
My name is Dawn Lancy Walker. I'm from Rebuilding Alliance, um, which is a small nonprofit that rebuilds war torn communities and brings the world together to make them safe. We've been getting solar lights into Gaza, 27,000 solar lights through the blockade. And tomorrow's the day that the um, authorities turn over, that, that um, the Palestinian Authority will take the lead at the border controls for all shipments coming in and out. And it, it's actually a, a milestone. It, it, it should be the precipitous milestone to end the blockade, actually. Um, and whether it gets reported or not, you know, certainly the electricity crisis was framed as a conflict between who is paying the bill without even mentioning that people could pay their own bill if they had a job. Um, so I wonder, my question is, how do you get a story, a solution story forward? Uh, it sounds like tweeting is the key, um, but then how does one reach out to you? Um, is it just as simple as, as sending you a, a, a pitch, you know, to your email, or, or what's the best way to reach you, so other this, than being this, here? This, this is a, a good question. What's your favorite, this is, everyone, I think each journalist has their own kind of favorite way of receiving a pitch. Do you have like a, a preference? What's your, yeah. I'm, I'm on all social media, so uh, Twitter works for me. I feel like a lot of my sources and journalists um, use, use Twitter to communicate, so. Um, and I'm happy to hear you bring up uh, Gaza. It's a huge, huge moment in the peace process, as you said, could be the beginning of the end of an over 10-year siege. Um, and what's been so heartbreaking is it's been over the past few weeks that there's been uh, monumental developments in that, and we haven't been able... The coverage that I've seen coming out of Gaza was that there was a, a security issue uh, yesterday, and the only reason this... Uh, transfer of control was mentioned, it was because there was a security issue uh, yesterday. So it is really, really heartbreaking, and I think that's why um, we think of Israel-Palestine as an intractable conflict, when in fact there have been, there are people on both sides working tirelessly, and there are absolutely um, elements of the peace process that could be moving forward right now if, if there was some pressure. I'll show, I'll show my agent say email works for me, so... <laughs> <laughs> Email, tweets, everything, it's, it's, it's helpful. I think, the, I, I think the key is to, to show and demonstrate that news hook, though, as, mm -hmm. as you, you clearly have. Um, yes. Yeah. Hi, I'm Steve Ross. I'm consulting now, but I spent the last few years in Myanmar working on the Rakhine Rohingya conflict. And in that experience, I saw, on the one hand, the importance of good, nuanced, fact-based journalism in terms of awareness raising and you know, making the community aware of, the international community aware of what was happening and is happening on the ground there. But on the other hand, I saw the way in which international media was used to um, further uh, the perception of bias among the international community and, and in some ways made my work as a peace builder more difficult. <coughs> It made it harder to bring communities together on the ground. And I'd just be curious in, in whether or not you've encountered that paradox, and if so, how you approach it. And you know, I think uh, part of the solution is building up a better media base within the country to be able to understand and process um, both local and international media sources. Uh, but I think it's, it's a real challenge for those of us that are working for, for solutions on the ground when uh, international media is is used in a way by local communities that um, pushes communities apart as opposed to bringing them together. Could, could you just like cite a specific example of that happening and, and how that manifested in itself and in your work? Sure. Um, I can't think of a specific article, but most of the coverage on Rakhine Rohingya um, is perceived by uh, the Burmese community, the Burmese government, uh, the Rakhine, local Buddhist Rakhine community as even if it is uh, from our perspective based in fact as being, as, as having an agenda against them and s it, it, it makes them feel besieged um, and thus at a, a local level makes it harder to bring communities together. So just in this past week there were massive protests in Yangon in support of the military and Aung San Suu Kyi's government um, for the, the propagation of what's going on in, in Rakhine now. And part of that is a response to the way in which the events have been covered internationally. 
So have, have you seen that, that sort of feedback loop in action? Yeah, there's a, the, the media tend to be self-referential. Uh, we have to accept that, that we have to hold up our hands sometimes. Uh, we, it's, it's difficult to get to areas, so we're, sometimes we're dependent on the NGOs to take us. I mean, they, and obviously, we come with our own frames of reference. So it, it, it is, it, it, there is a, there's a danger there. But also, there's some remarkable journalism as well. It's, it's a, the flip side of it. Um, in a sense, you know, media can help the peace process, and they can also hinder. Um, the media tends to look for a very personal frame, which can drive and, 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 and kind of erode nuance and make it personal, which can also obviously hinder those, those sort of peace efforts. But I think we also see, as I said, some remarkable journalism. And I think whenever the media is under threat, as we're seeing it globally, I think we start seeing some, some, some the media response. I mean, what the New York Times is doing, what, and I'm now getting away from Myanmar. <laughs> I'm talking about the American political process. What we're, this kind of journalism we're seeing now is, I think, it's, it's, it's never been so good. But yes, there's problems. I found in Syria and Israel, Palestine, that because the negotiations are really delicate, uh, there's been a lot of uh, lock and key around um, some of these things, but that does make it really difficult for journalists to practice solutions journalism because then it makes it very difficult to understand why the UN is compromising with Assad, for example, on something. And maybe it's because they uh, will be forfeiting their access to a, a community where civilians need aid. So those kinds of decisions, not to say that they wouldn't report on this uh, work being done with Assad that is absolutely controversial, probably maybe corrupt, um, and, but understanding these choices of circumstance in a conflict or actors that are trying to um, engage constructively, um, we're not always going to be on the same page as the NGOs that are doing that peace building, but at least it would allow for a more responsible and comprehensive understanding of why these decisions are made in a really tough scenario. So I'm wondering if I could like flip the premise of your question and uh, ask the panelists if you can think of any examples of sort of international stories, international news reports, sort of enhancing uh, the peace process or bringing people together on the ground that otherwise might, you know, might have hang-ups about coming together on the ground. It's, it, I'm like, I'm kind of, maybe Colombia is a good example of that. I'm, I'm sort of struggling to think of something on the top of my head, but I, I can't. And I'm wondering if, if you might be able to. It's usually a process rather than one definitive moment. But, but I think what, what you're seeing in terms of, of radio, radio is a, it's a fantastic medium for this because you can bring opponents together and you can hash out the problem. So I think we're seeing, in terms of how radio is used, we see that a lot of that as one example. Yeah. We talked a little bit about this um, previously, uh, but the Northern Ireland peace polls and that conflict, um, one of the most important elements was the media not sensationalizing a peace process and also committing to publishing accurate data on the population. They were polling different segments of society to see if there was a moderate majority. And they found even when the sub-polling that a lot of times the loudest voices in the room are not reflective of their constituencies. And that polling process allowed the media to go back to the um, communities and say, well, even if this uh, antagonist to the peace process is saying this, actually his community doesn't reflect this. And it kept a lot of players in the process. Not all of them, it wasn't perfect. Um, but that seems to be an example of me the media behaving responsibly and for once, not just uh, you know publishing the loudest voice in the room, but um, doing that extra step, that due diligence, figuring out the context. I know they've tried to apply that to Israel-Palestine, and it didn't work because of fragmented media and um, kind of uh, disagreements about even publishing that that kind of uh, polling information. But um, it's something that I know uh, state or. Er, different negotiators have tried um, and for me something that's interesting to see the media for once play a constructive role and not just going to the loudest voice in the room. Uh, maybe to say it as a process as well that it's, it's not just the, the peace treaty but there's a, it's a longer road. Hi, 
I'm Jessica Murray. I work for Search for Common Ground. So we're the world's largest dedicated peace building organization and we do a ton of projects all over the world. A big chunk are media projects and a chunk of those are actually training journalists on responsible journalism at a local level. So training local journalists on um, how to not add fuel to the fire when it comes to conflict, but actually report in a really responsible way that looks at both sides, no matter what ethnic group they're on. And so um, my question for you guys is we've talked a lot about kind of like the business model, how, how that kind of um, adds a lot to the problem. How much of it is the business model, especially in some of these conflict areas, and how much of it is actually the capacity building for journalists that, that might not have some of the, the necessary tools and information on how to report responsibly? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the ethics of journalism is, is, is really important, and I think that's, I think that there's, there's another problem with, with, with media is that we're, we're losing some of our, on, locally we're losing some of our best journalists who are becoming PR consultants or joining NGOs, and they've stopped practicing journalism. Um, but I think the, you know, to reiterate, the, the professional uh, ethics of journalism is vital, accountability, verification, etc. And that's, it's an ongoing process, um, and that's all you can try and do. And, and obviously to, to show examples of positive journalism. But I, I think people instinctively understand it, but in crisis situations, it becomes very difficult. You know, who's your reference group, in, in or out? You know. and, I mean, Anna, I'm sure in your work in Syria, you've worked, worked with you know, what we call fixers, or they would call them problems and tools, journalists. Um, what more can be done to support you know, people who really are putting their lives on the line like that. Syria is, um, you know, a heartbreaking example because the past couple of years it's been one of Syria and Iraq, some of the deadliest places for journalists on earth. Oh, sorry. Um, Syria and Iraq have been some of the deadliest places on earth for journalists over the past couple of years. We've lost so many local colleagues, it's unbelievable. But one of the exciting things that's happened is early on, probably by uh, 2000, I mean, by 2012, there were a lot of journalists who'd been uh, kidnapped, killed. By 2013, that was, uh, there were something like 13 kidnappings in the month of July alone. After that, obviously, 2014, there were the high-profile executions of foreign journalists. So that's not to say the whole time local journalists were being kidnapped without the high-profile international press um, giving them some attention or some recourse. Uh, so. By like 2015, there weren't, there wasn't a lot of domestic or internal press coverage of the Syrian theater. So all of this news coverage has been coming from Syrian journalists. Some of the really neat things have been uh, there's uh, an institute. I wish I remembered their name right now. They trained a lot of uh, Syrian women journalists to stay inside the opposition-held uh, areas in the north, and those women trained um, other women and men um, to to create ethical journalism, they created this whole channel. It's, it's really amazing. And some of these women hadn't um, ever written before anything like this, and they're doing professional level work, and that they were kind of our lifeline of information. Um, we just had the Emmys, and one of those uh, women journalists uh, won, won an Emmy for her coverage of the, um, the chemical weapons attacks in, in, Ale in Aleppo, in Aleppo province. So we've seen some incredible um, victories for journalism and freedom of information because of this training that started just a few years ago. So I think these kinds of programs are really exciting and that we can see quick returns on them too. Uh, we might have time for one more quick question. Uh, <coughs> yes. Thanks. I, I can just speak. Um, my name is Dave Gersky. I now work with a new organization called NMV Peace Partners. But previously worked on the research side and I've also been involved in a few different peace processes and um, from my experience there, thanks. Um, although it is sensitive and there's this weird dynamic around covering uh, peace processes, from the inside my experience has been that actually you're also living in a bubble. So the perception is that the people inside the process know everything and they under, and the reality is, in, in my experience, has been very different. So you have a lot of information about a very limited amount of, of whatever it is that you're focusing on, but you actually have less sense of context, and international reporting is often a very important part of, for people working on that process of staying involved or, or keeping abreast of um, the larger dynamics because you get cut off from them. 
the question is how you've, you've spoken about engaging with or targeting international, an international audience. I wonder how you think about interacting with local media and local journalists in the countries that you're covering and if you've had opportunities or times where you're also producing things with uh, an eye towards a local audience and, and how that works both in terms of language and also in terms of whether how you interact with local media and, and local audiences. Thank you. What's your, what's your take? Aaron. Aaron, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think that those are really valid points. I mean, in a sense, the media can can set the agenda in a sense for for the peace process, but you're not always know exactly what's going on, and there's times when the media needs to keep quiet um, because of the mediation process. But but the question about about local local media, I mean, we, we translate our material into Arabic and French. Um, we we don't we don't have vernacular languages, um, but working in terms of how. We work with the local media. We obviously work with local journalists. Um, our material is free. We want it to circulate uh, with, within the local media, uh, and it does. Um, but And to, to support that process as, as best we can. Um, I think the, the kind of coverage we try and do is, is that it's, 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 a, it's, it's against those sort of elite peace processes that we often see in these huddles, and it's more about the impact on the community, how that's the kind of journalism that I, I think is important to try and remember um, that this is part of a broader issue within society and those people shouldn't be forgotten. Uh, any concluding thoughts, Anna, on, on that question or anything else? Okay, well, good. We're, we're just about out of time, but thank you all for, uh, for your great questions and for participating in this. If I can maybe leave you with one parting thought, it would be that <laughs> Uh, you know, don't despair. I, I, I do know that we've talked a lot about, about how our industry is in peril, but like I said, there are examples of, of innovators uh, like these two people on, on the panel that are doing great work. Uh, it just needs a, a little more support and, and a little more light shined on it. Thank you all. <laughs>